Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a project update video for this 1-6 scale Armortech radio controlled German King Tiger heavy tank. Since the last video update, more of the tank's external detail fittings have been added, many of which are going to be fully functional. We'll be going over these additions in this video. So stay tuned because there's going to be a lot of info flying right at you. In one of the last update videos for this project, I discussed the work that went into assembling of the front and rear tin work. Well, in that video, I discussed that the components themselves were completed. However, there's one bit of detailing that still needs to be added. And that detailing we have right here on the table now. What these components are, are the lock mechanisms for both the front and the rear tin work. This set here is a new addition to the EastCoastArmory.com catalog and it consists entirely of 3D printed components. All the components that you see here are what's needed to equip one King Tiger for both the front as well as the rear. And the reason why I went with this design route was because I've actually fabricated these parts before on previous builds and I even made them out of metal. They were a functional bit of equipment, however, one thing I quickly noticed is because of the very small size that these pieces are, they tend to be very frail and break extremely easily. With that in mind, for this set here, I designed to be solely just for display purposes only, and they will give you the look and feel of the component, however, you're not going to have the fragility of the piece being functional. This set here is a really easy component to drop in place and once added gives you that extra little bit of detailing which isn't present on the stock ArmorTech kit. And of course since this set here is in 1-6 scale it will work on not just the ArmorTech model but on any 1-6 scale King Tigers that are on the 1-6 scale market. Like what we've seen in the last couple videos the top front portion of the King Tigers armor deck is starting to fill in with its detailing. Well the remainder of the details consist of the parts that we have here. These three parts consist of a driver periscope, which will be located in the front. And these two units here consist of the detailing, which is for the radio operator. All the components that you see on the table here are stocked with the Armor Tech kit. The parts consist of components either fabricated out of CNC aluminum, like this periscope block, this mounting plate, or they are... Con they're comprised of parts made from laser cut and bent steel, like these two brush guards that we have here. The brush guards are nicely bent in shape, they do have their appropriate curves to them, and are a nice touch. When it comes to the periscopes themselves, they are again on the basic end. If you notice on the drivers, or I should say on the radio operators periscope, it's just a big flat plate. There's no other detailing which is present, and this is of course something that I am going to add. Same can also be said for this unit that we have here. Now when it comes time for installing this to this plate here, it just drops directly in place. If you notice the tolerances are a bit on this snugger end, which is common for these Armor Tech kits. But the instructions want you to just glue this component to this plate in a permanent manner. However, one modification that I make to these Armor Tech King Tigers is this is a nice portion to add some animation to, i.e. having the piece pivot. You see on the real King Tiger, the crew member can actually rotate this unit so he gets a better field of view. And this is a detailing and feature that I like to build into these Armortech King Tigers. To further enhance the bow periscopes, I actually developed this set that we have here. This is a new set from EastCoastArmory.com, and what it is is they are HD 3D printed periscope inserts. What this set does is it gives you the illusion that the stock component has its prism detailing. If we look at the stock piece, like I showcased before, it's flat without any sort of detailing present on the face. With this insert here, you have the detailing for both the prism as well as the box frame. The unit just drops directly into place, and when it does, you get the detailing which is absent on the original kit. These pieces are HD 3D printed, so in order to paint them, you just paint the back portion as well as the little frame components, and you have the look and feel of the prism. Another advantage that this set has is that this set can be added to just about any pre-built ArmorTech King Tiger model. All you gotta do is just paint the set and just drop them directly into place, and you don't have to do anything else to them. When it comes time for fitting the periscopes to the top deck of the tank, one of the units, namely this one here, it's pretty straightforward. The unit just basically plugs directly in place and you're done. For the, the driver's 
periscope it's a little bit more in depth first and foremost you need to install this plate here to the top deck now right now the top deck is upside down if you haven't noticed and the unit just basically goes into place here and it's secured by two fasteners the piece itself is decently engineered it fits directly in place you don't have to remove any sort of material on the sides in order to get it to fit in and the holes do line up however one small alteration that needs to be done by the builder on this generation of king tiger and by the way i'm not sure if this was true for the one that came before this or even the kits that came after this but on this one here you need to make a slight modification to the corners here you'll notice that they are just a straight 90 degree cut but you do have to add a radius to them why this is relevant is if you'll notice on the top deck here there is a radius that is present and if i line up the piece it's not going to lock in all the way because it bottoms out right here on the curves you can address this one of two ways you either take a square file and just put the notches in at on the top deck plate or you could do what I'm going to do, and I'm just going to add the radius cuts to these pieces over here. This is going to be done using a Dremel with a high-speed removal bit, and I'm just going to go ahead and just remove the amount of material required in order to get the piece to fit in snug. If you do not have a Dremel with the high-speed removal bit on hand, you could do the exact same procedure with a file. Here's the same plate with one of the radius cuts added, and you can see with a pencil I went ahead and marked exactly how much material needs to be removed in order to get the piece to fit on. Like I said before, I'm going to use the Dremel with a high-speed removal bit. This material does cut away fairly easily with this method. And once added, you can then mount it to the tank. One thing I do want to point out is that you do have a lot of leeway here, so you don't have the risk of making a mistake and possibly ruining the component due to the thicknesses of these parts. So just a few passes, and you're basically good to go. If I take the part now, put it in place, you can see how it easily just fits in, and you can see that the holes line up absolutely perfectly. From here, this plate's just going to get bolted on as per the kit. But before I do that, though, I am going to go ahead and get this unit thoroughly primed. The next bit of equipment we're going to be discussing is the front headlight. The Armor Tech kit supplies you the headlight that we see right here on the table, and it is a fantastic bit of equipment. This component here, it's made from cast bronze. It is a fully functional piece where it lights up, but even the cover itself can come off. Basically, it's everything you want for a Bosch light in 1.6 scale. I'm not sure if this is the case for the current generation of Armor Tech kits, but for the last decade or so, Armor Tech supplied you with these components that we have here, which I believe are actually from an aftermarket supplier. These headlights are so good, in fact, that honestly you don't need to track down a replacement. They are good to go directly out of the box. They supply you with the headlight, the cover, as well as the armored cover cap that we have right here. Just like with the remainder of the headlight components, it's made out of the same cast metal alloy and they are perfect out of the box. As nice as this set is, the one thing that I am gonna have to fabricate will be the bracket that the lamp sits on. Armor Tech does supply you with a laser cut sheet metal bracket. However, it's very basic in its overall shape and detailing. On the King Tiger, there was this design for the bracket mount which was pretty unique for the king tiger and i'll be discussing that once i actually crack into it and start the fabrication in addition to the headlight another bit of detailing that i'm going to be working on at this point now is the tail light the rear convoy light that we have here is a recent addition to the eca product line and it's actually one that developed really as a happy accident you see i was working on a 116 scale Tiger One a little while ago, and when I was building that tank, I decided to tool up the rear convoy light. Well, I went ahead and illustrated everything out, and then I built it in CAD, uploaded it to the printer, and when I ordered the, the test samples, to my surprise, they were a tad bigger than what they were originally intended to be. See, as it turns out, when I uploaded the file, I made a mistake with the numbers on some of the dimensions and rather than printing out a 1 16 scale it printed out in this size here which it's as a turn of fate turns out it's 1 6 scale so 
that's how the 1-6 scale units have been developed and why they're on the catalog today. This set here is offered in two different versions. Note, you'll see that the piece is all made of HD 3D print, but we have two variants. This one here is the insulatorless version, which is just a standard tube. And then we have the version with the insulator that has a sleeve over it with those little squares that are found in the insulator jacket. On the rear end of the stem here, you'll see a small little domed object. This is your rear reflector, and this is also going to be used on this build. The sets themselves are designed for static use. However, I'm going to be reworking the 1-6 scale set that we have here so that there's going to be an option available that has the tube separate from the base, which will allow you to hide a LED on the inside of a clear transparent tube. However, this is something really more or less to be discussed in a upcoming video, but at the moment here, I could go ahead and revise this unit that I have here, converting it from static to lighted, and I'm also going to be fabricating the remainder of the base required for the rear reflector. And after a little bit of fabrication, here we have the bracket now ready for installation. The bracket itself is made from a bent piece of sheet metal, and then this little pin here was soldered in place. And then from here, I could go ahead and drill a corresponding hole into the tank and then just mount the unit accordingly. Of course, sculpted weld beads are going to be added in order to complete the look. On the reflector here, this is the same unit that was shown before. And the way I like to paint them is the same way, like I mentioned in my other smaller scale videos, I take the red paint and I paint the back portion of the reflector. This will give you a nice little amber glow to the piece here and then the little frame is going to be painted with a little bit of Dunkel Gelb. This will be all that's required in order to complete the small little reflector. Back to the headlight. Here we have the headlight from before and I'm going to be making some modifications to this as well and I'll be going over exactly why in a moment. But what I really want to focus on is the actual bracket. Here we have the bracket that I'm going to be using to secure the headlight to the tank. This bracket here is 100% scratch built and it's made out of the same galvanized sheet steel that I mentioned in a few other videos. The piece is soldered together to ensure the utmost strength and you'll notice that I soldered on a really long bolt to the bottom portion here. And if you're watching this and saying, well, John, why did you go ahead and fabricate this component? Doesn't Armatech supply you with this exact same piece? And the answer is yes, they do, but the piece leaves a little bit for improvement. You see, the stock Armatech piece is just a plate just like this with the holes pre-drilled in, and it just extends out and then bends upward. It is then secured to the tank via two fasteners that are pre-drilled and tapped into the front armored plate. The stock piece is pretty sturdy and does a great job with supporting the weight of the headlight keeping it in place. However, it does have some drawbacks to it. Namely, it's missing the bottom portion that we have here. And with the way it extends backward with those two fasteners, it does hurt the look detail-wise because it is absent on the real vehicle. Instead, on the real vehicle, it had this type of a setup where we had this plate with this distinctive little wedge-shaped support strut, and then this entire plate would be welded to the front armor plate of the tank. For the model here, the piece was fabricated, but you'll notice that I went ahead and, and soldered on this really long bolt. The reason why this bolt needs to be this long is that this is how it's going to secure to the front armor plate. As we can recall, the Armortech kit's armor plate is massive in its thickness, so you need a crazy long bolt like this just to penetrate through so you can mount a nut on the inside. By securing it with this approach here, this gives you the support of the piece where it's nice and strong and pretty durable, but it also gives you the detail fidelity in order to have the piece better replicate the real unit. The Bosch light is simply going to get bolted to this unit with its integral mounted holes and I'm going to be using small micro hex bolts that are the same size in order to do the mounting. Once this unit is secured to the tank I then sculpt the weld beads which will complete the look and also will hide and conceal the nut or I should say the hex portion here of this fastener. I also want to take this opportunity to say that if you are watching this video and you like this bit of detailing here and want to add it to your own King Tiger build, I actually have this exact same designed piece but in 3D print. The 3D printed component has been listed to the EastCoastArmory.com catalog and you can see screenshots of it or sample renders of it right here in this corner. The piece is a single piece construction and it assembles or mounts the tank in basically the exact same way. Only instead of this long threaded shaft there's a 
a retention cup on the end that simply gets inserted in place and then once the adhesive set your piece is then mounted to the vehicle. With the bracket out of the way, I can now turn my attention to the headlight itself. The headlight is perfect detailing wise, nothing needs to be made to this piece. The only change, or I should say slight tweak that I'm going to make, involves the bottom conduit. You see on the bottom portion here of the light, the main power cable for the light bulb inside descends downward, which is exactly what you want as per the real vehicle in that respect. The one change though that I need to make is with how it descends down. You notice it just drops directly out of the bottom of the of the bracket, but on the real tank it would actually emerge from this little fitting that we have here. In order to do this I'm going to need to drill into this section over here and then once it's drilled out I could then fish the wire through this section so that it emerges like the way you would see it in this manner. This is absolutely important because once the the unit gets bolted to the plate you can see how the wire is kind of in the way. To drill the hole out, I'm going to be, of course, using the drill press. This is one procedure where the drill press is basically going to be required, if not mandatory. You can possibly try to do this freehand with a Dremel or with a drill on a vise, but honestly, the drill press is the best way to go. The eighth of an inch drill bit is what's going to be used to bore this out. The eighth of an inch bit is plenty big enough to allow the clearance of the wires as well as the shrink tubing jacket that we have here. The hole is already indented slightly in the fitting and this again comes like this as per the aftermarket piece. So this will help align the new drill bit here to center it and go all the way through the material. Once the piece is drilled out, you're then ready to snake the wire through. As you can see, the, the drill bit with the drill press makes real short work of this procedure. Be sure to deburr or remove any sort of fragments that are remaining from the drilling process. This will allow the wire to slide in with less effort and will also prevent any sort of snaggings or possibly even damage to the jackets of the wires or even the shrink tubing that we have here. As you can see, once the hole is drilled, the wire just pulls right through. It is a bit tricky at first due to these two loose wires and to compound it, you have their leads that are a bit on the frayed side. But once you're able to get the two sections out through this hole here, the entire cable just yanks right through. And this is of course is done with ease because of the eighth of an inch drill bit hole that I just mentioned. While on that note, you can also see on the bottom here that I don't have the piece overly tight. There's a little bit of slack that comes down and has this nice little bend to it. You don't want to have this piece tied too much because this can cause problems with the, with the wires. But you want to have a nice little bend here because, well, frankly, it's, this is exactly how it would look on the real vehicle. After the primer set on the headlight, I then mounted it to the bracket. As you can see for the mounting, I used the four micro brass fasteners that I mentioned before. These were just some units that I had on hand and are not kit supplied. From here now, I could then secure it to the vehicle and this is where things are going to get interesting because in order to secure this, I do have to do a bit of a magic trick and I'll walk you guys along on how that's actually done. Jumping back to the tank, here we have the front glasses plate and here you can see the three holes which are found on the stock armor tech kit in order to secure the headlight and the headlight bracket in place. The most important hole is this one dead in the center. With the way the kit's originally designed, this hole here is for the electrical conduit, or I should say the electrical wire from the light to enter directly into the tank. These other two smaller holes, these are the drill and tap holes that I mentioned before that are used to secure two fasteners which bolt the plate where it needs to be. Also supplied with the Armor Tech set is this length of flexible, or I should say semi-flexible, aluminum wire. The aluminum wire is to facilitate the remaining detail of that distinctive conduit that runs along the top portion here of the front glasses plate, goes around the, the plate on the inside here, and then turns and enters into that conduit end fitting that I showed earlier. The kit supply component is actually very good quality. In fact, I used it on my personal King Tiger build that I built a number of years ago. 
However, for this build, it's not going to be used. Not because there's anything wrong with the quality or anything, it's because that unlike my tank, which the top deck was permanently bolted to the vehicle, for this model here, the top deck is removable. And because of that, having that material used for this purpose is a bit problematic. You see that wire, although it's flexible to a point where you can configure it to the location that you want it in, it's not really good if you need to make something removable. The wire, once you bend it in place and paint it, if you try to go ahead and make it a removable part, you run the risk of damaging the paint that's on the surface as when you try to bend it around, the paint's going to start to brittle, crack off, and it's going to lead to some problems. Also, there's a finite amount of times where you could bend that material before it just outright snaps on you. In its place, I'm going to be utilizing, really I'm going to be taking the same technique that I used on the late production Armortech build I did a number of years ago. If we recall, on that build, it utilized a similar process, or I should say it had a similar need for the detail to be present. However, it also had to be fully flexible in order to take off the top deck. In order to do this, I'm going to be replacing the stock Armortech wire with a more flexible electrical wire, which will give me the correct detail that is required, but will also be flexible so it doesn't break if slash when any need arises to take off the top deck. However, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself because before I can actually worry about the detailing found on this conduit over here, I need to first mount on the headlight. And that brings us back to this hole that we have here in the middle. This hole, like I said before, is originally used for the electrical wire to pass into the hull, but I'm going to change that so that it's going to be used now as the location to mount on the bow headlight. However, I need to do one step before I can go ahead and actually fasten this to the tank. You see, if I take the unit and drop it in place, you'll see that it doesn't exactly sit flush onto the surface of the metal plate, and that's because of the, the nut, or I should say the head portion here, of the bolt. The bolt descends slightly from the bottom portion of this angle here, and because of that, it's not sitting level with the plate. In order to mount this component into this location here, I am going to have to make a slight adjustment to the hole found here on the armor plate. To do this, I need to bore out some material on this section over here, which will allow the bolt head to sink past the surface, and then it will allow the bracket to then sit flush onto the front plate section. In order to do this, I need to use a quarter of an inch drill bit. Here I have my hand drill, and I'm going to carefully remove a slight bit of material from this location over here. The amount of material removed is an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch at max. Now normally, this type of technique has been on the risky side, specifically if you're not paying attention, you could easily overbore into the plate going directly through, which will lead for some problems. However, with the front plate over here, you do have some insurance because the sheer thickness of this front plate, which was mentioned in part one of this video series, as we can, we can recall, this plate here is scale thickness, so it's over an inch thick. Because of that, you have to really be purposely trying to screw this up in order to remove too much material. Hopefully I could do this on camera without putting any severe drop shadows onto the location here, but let's give it a shot. And that's it. Like I said, the material itself gets removed fairly quickly, and not a whole lot needs to be removed in order for you to get the appropriate depth. Of course, just like anything you drill, you are going to have a small little burr remaining on the surface over here, so just a quick little rub down with some sandpaper. We'll flush that out, and then from here, the piece can drop directly into place. Before I could go ahead and permanently fasten the headlight to the vehicle, there's another hole I need to drill. It needs to be drilled slightly above the other two holes that we have here. This hole is going to be for the electrical wire. Now, like I said before, there is a magic trick that needs to be done on this portion over here in order to conceal the electrical wiring, but also to give you that detailing of the center conduit. In order to do this, we need to have the headlight wiring enter into the tank via the front glasses plate. Then the detail conduit will start from this point and move its way up into its end location. The trick comes in how to conceal the two locations together to make it look like it's one seamless piece. In order to do that, the first thing I need to do, of course, though, is drill a brand new hole, which is going to be an eighth of an inch in diameter, in order to 
plug, or I should say, insert the wire into the vehicle. This has to be drilled, of course, without the headlight present, because trying to get in here with all that equipment in the way is a bit problematic. After some quick drilling, you can see two holes here that have been added to the surface. Some people are probably saying, ha, that's because he screwed up and he put the hole in the wrong place. Well, the answer is no, I didn't. I put the second hole there on purpose, and I'll touch upon that in a moment. But from here, I'm now ready to secure the headlight to the vehicle permanently. And after a few rotations with the socket driver, the headlight is now permanently installed to the vehicle. You'll also notice that the power cord enters directly into the tank's hull. It is at this point now where I can add the detail of the conduit that I mentioned before. As the plate progresses along, here we have the electrical conduit now mounted. This is 22 gauge electrical wire. This is solid core, but stranded core will work equally as well. With the wire now fitted, the next area to concentrate on is this little portion have, that we have here. The wire itself is just glued directly to the front armor plate with super glue. I currently left the wire a little bit long on purpose because once the welding detail is going to be added, I can then complete the electrical top fitting, which will be touched upon momentarily. But that leads us back to this portion over here. You can see that there is a little gap in between the real electrical wire as well as the faux detail piece. And this is where the magic comes in. In order to make these look like they're one continuous piece, I have to add some kind of a connecting tube to these two locations. And with the addition of one new piece, you can see how everything is starting to take shape. I went ahead and fabricated this little connecting piece over here, which bridges the gap between the power cord that emerges from the headlight, and the detail conduit that we have here. This piece is fabricated out of a thin piece of shrink tubing. I went ahead and added a slit on the bottom portion so it wraps around both the conduit and the wiring, kind of like a sock. I then add a little bit of drop of glute so that it adheres to both, and then I hit it with the heat gun in order to just constrict it in place. Some people are watching this though and are saying, yeah, John, that's nice and dandy, but I can clearly see the a conduit, or I should say the light cable, entering into the hole in this location over here. And the answer to that is, for right now, you can, but I'm going to be adding the welds now, which is going to basically cover up all visible cues of this little gap that we have here, and flare it into the detailing of the tank. And after the welds are added, you can see how the unit is fully flushed out, and how it blends in with the remainder of the vehicle's detailing. Hopefully it comes down to the lighting situation, but you can see on the bottom portion where I had to bore out that extra material has been completely encased with the sculpted weld bead detailing and any trace of that hole as well as those other two holes found on the top are no longer present. On the conduit here, you note there are three strips of welds found in this section. This was lifted from one of the real King Tigers I was studying. And here you can see how the conduit then enters over the top and into its and box fitting. The fitting here is the kit supply one, but underwent a slight modification in order to mount it to the model. First, I bored out the portion over here for the wire to plug into it, and I'll touch upon that in a moment. But another modification I made involved it securing to the top deck. You see, like what we saw earlier, the bottom portion has an integrally casted on threaded section so that you just mount it to the tank hull and then you secure it on with a nut. Well, with the thicknesses of the top plate over here, the thread section was slightly too short and didn't protrude from the bottom of the deck. In order to secure to the model, I went ahead and cut away the molded in threaded section, drilled and tapped a new hole where the original unit was. By doing this, I was then able to secure this to the tank via a single fastener with some Loctite on it. And once fastened in place, this unit here is not gonna move around anymore. Back to the conduit wire. The wire itself enters into the fitting, but it is not glued in. Like what was mentioned before, the entire top deck needs to be removable, so if this was connected to each other in a permanent manner, this would be very problematic. In order to take the top deck off, you simply just grab the wire and you slightly tug on it. It's going to emerge from the fitting. At that point there, you can then just grab the top deck and just remove it. With this format, you can see that it makes for a very problem-free removal and you, and you minimize the risk of damage to the paint as well as to some of the details. In order to put the top deck back on, you just line it up right here with this nice hefty chunk of metal that's found on the armor plate. And then the unit just slides into place. Let go of the back, the magnets will reconnect 
the top deck for you. And then this guy here just plugs directly in its happy little sweet spot and no one else is the wiser. From the conduit, it takes us back to the bow periscopes, and you can see that this detailing has been mounted to the model at this time. As the build progresses and it gets closer to the end point where it gets painted, all of this is going to be masked up to prevent any sort of paint from getting into these sections over here. The reason why these need to be fitted to the model at this time is because, well, frankly, when it comes time for painting, the bracket needs to be mounted and its sculpted welds need to be added. You can't really do this in an efficient way after everything is pre-painted. It just leads for some problems. The piece itself, the inside, has been weathered on both the top portion of the deck, as well as the inside portion here of the brush guard. So the piece is thoroughly painted and weathered throughout. The same exact procedure was done to the one on the opposite side, but the one on the opposite side featured a slight modification that I'll touch upon in a moment. When it comes time for the installation, the piece was a somewhat snug fit, which is what we typically see on these components on like this type of an assembly. However, mounting it was very easily done. Basically, with the Dremel with a high-speed removal bit, I went ahead and just removed a slight bit amount of material on, off the top deck to a certain point where the periscope then just drops directly into place. Once it slides in, some glue later, and the piece is permanently attached. You'll also see at this point here that the ECA 3D printed periscope lens faces have been added, and you can also see how much they improve the look of the piece compared to just leaving it with its stock format being totally flat. Moving to the opposite side takes to the driver's periscope. This unit here required a little bit more steps compared to the one on the opposite side because, well, it's a little bit more complex. Just like with the opposite side, the brush guard has been added. This is the kit supplied unit. However, for this one here, I noticed it didn't really fit onto the kit allocated locations. So some tweaks had to have been made with the help of a vise as well as a pair of pliers. Once everything was bent here or there, the piece was then able to drop directly into place without any other modifications. Of course, like with the other units, this unit here has been thoroughly primed, painted, and weathered for the same reasons that I mentioned before. One feature that I built into this model here that differs it from the one on the opposite side, whereas the one from the opposite side is a static mounted piece, this one here does have some animation to it. You can see, if I could get my fingers in here, I can actually rotate the unit. And this is a modification that I made to the kit. This unit here is now going to be patched into a servo, and I'll be able to have the piece pivot via the radio. More information on this, however, is to come in the next update. However, before I do that, though, I can at least show how the unit is modified so that it can be able to pivot. Also, as a quick note, you can see the prism detailing found on this component here, just like I mentioned on the one on the opposite side. With the top deck off of the model, you can see how I went ahead and modified it so that it can rotate. Basically, the piece itself is pretty much kit designed. The only change I made was with the addition of this PVC ring that we have here. With the way the kit is designed, the periscope just drops directly into place and then you just glue it shut. Well, in order to make it pivot, all I had to do was prevent the, the top portion of the periscope to drop out. And this was facilitated with this PVC ring. It's nothing more than a PVC tube that I went ahead and cut. The tube itself fits perfectly onto the descending stub that we have here on the bottom portion of the periscope. In order to secure it, both super glue was used, but I also went ahead, drilled two 16 of an inch holes on either side here, and I pinned it in place with a 16 of an inch rod. By doing this, the unit is permanently attached, and you don't have to worry about the piece ever dropping out on you. In order to convert it for radio control, all I'm going to do is add a clevis on some point here on the ring, and then this is going to connect via linkage to a servo, which, when actuated, will facilitate the pivoting nature. While on the top deck, one other thing I want to mention involves some of the bodywork that was completed. You see, like I mentioned in the other video, the top deck featured several locations for mounting fasteners, both kit supplied as well as others that I added myself. The kit supplied fastener locations were used, or I should say are originally intended to secure the top deck to the tank permanently, while the other locations that I mentioned are were added by myself so that the magnet system can be installed. One byproduct of all of these holes that are drilled into the top deck is that it looks unsightly when the model is fully completed. So I went through the process of deleting all of the locations where the fasteners were present. The bodywork has been completed and at this point here I can move on to add the sculpted weld beads which will be discussed in the next video. 
And while on the topic of weld beads, you can see some other changes that have been made to the model since the last video update. That involves the hinge work here for the tin work. If we can recall in the last video, the hinges were secured to the vehicle via the fasteners as per the kit. And with the way the kit is designed, you have three countersunk fasteners that are exposed in these three locations. On the model here, the fastener locations were plugged up and sanded flush via the bodywork, and the surrounding hinge areas have their sculpted weld beads now added. With the addition of these welds here, the hinge work for the tin work is now complete. Same can also be said on the ones on the rear that I'll touch upon in a second. Outside of the weld beads that I just mentioned, the last detailing that was mounted to the tin work com that completes it is the locking mechanism. This was the same 3D printed component that I mentioned before, and now you can see what it looks like added to the vehicle. The piece itself just drops directly into place. It does have its weld beads entirely printed, so you don't have to worry about sculpting these like the remainder of the welds that are found on the vehicle. Outside of mounting this detailing in place, the other mod that I made was to the side of the fender itself. You notice I drilled a small hole into this location over here. On the real vehicle, this hole obviously would be present because this is how the locking mechanism would secure the tin work in place and prevent it from flopping around. This is a mirror image on the opposite side of the vehicle. On the rear tin work, like I mentioned before, the welds have been added as well as the bodywork has been concluded. And from here you can see how the rear fender mounts are secured in place. And with the opposite side here you can see how the system would work. Here we have the bracket that I mentioned before as well as that other little pull tab. This tube is integrally found on the rear tin work on the King Tiger and basically with the way it works is when you want to lock the tin work in place in the down position there is a hole found on the bracket. You would then slide this tab in, it would lock into one of the corresponding holes thus securing it in place. To open it first you would unlock the, the tab swing the mud flap upward, and then you'll see another corresponding hole found on the top portion. This lines up with the tab, so that when you want to lock it in place, just pull in, it would go into the matching hole, and the piece would stay up. It's not going to do on this one, because the piece is just for detail purposes only, it's not functional, but you get the idea on how the system would actually function. From the tin work, this now brings us to the lower recess here of the vehicle, and you can see the reflector has now been mounted. This is the same detail part that I mentioned before, but now you can see it fitted to the vehicle, along with its sculpted weld beads that have been added. At this point, you can also see the reflector and how it fits to this piece. The reflector is not currently glued on because I need to first paint it, and this gets done at the very tail end of the build. And what, by painting it, I mean painting the little rim that's found around the edge of the reflector. Once the unit is fully painted, the piece will be dropped in place, thus completing the look. And I guess at this point it's a good place to wrap up this video. Currently I have a large number of the remaining engine compartment details that are either in print and finishing up now, or are actually on their way to the shop, which once in hand I could finally flesh out the remainder of that bit of detailing. But something like that is best discussed in the next project update video. So with that, that wraps up this project update video for this 1-6 scale radio controlled Armor Tech King Tiger Heavy Tank. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content being 1-6 scale project update videos like this guy over here or the other smaller scale model showcase videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in loop a new post of content is by liking us on Facebook. There I have more photographs of this particular build that have been published since the project start, as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that are showcased on this channel. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by eastcoastarmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks again. See you guys on the next one. Later.